Hello everyone and welcome to the Temple Institute uh, Parshat Hashavua class. Goes into the weekly reading of the Torah. My name is Gedalia Meyer and I live very close to Jerusalem and I'm excited about all things related to the Torah. I'm very excited about doing this class and I hope we can all gain something from it. With no further ado, let's get started. So it happens that this particular week, in addition to the regular Torah reading, there's a supplementary reading from a section of the Torah that has really nothing to do with the, the regular Torah reading. And this supplementary reading is really just a paragraph, uh, uh, and it's called Parshat Zechor, which means the section dealing with the word Zechor. And Zechor, it turns out, means remember. So let's get some background on what this additional section is all about. The section, it turns out, is actually a precursor to something else that comes up in the coming week, and that's why this particular section is read specifically on this week. So what's coming up next week? So for those in the know, it's the holiday of Purim. So this, of course, is a great celebration. All manner of, of celebration are done, including amongst various crowds, intoxication. Everybody has a good time on Purim. So what's Purim all about? Purim is when we read uh, a relatively short book of the Bible, the book of Esther. So the book of Esther talks about a time about 2,500 or so years ago when the Jews, who were all over the ancient Persian Empire, uh, a certain incident happened to them that could have been catastrophic, but due to um, very wise strategies on the part of some of the Jews, the uh, cat catastrophe was in some way uh, sort of uh, foiled. So what was the catastrophe? There was this viceroy of the kingdom, his name was Haman, who seemed to have it in for the Jews. And he decided that he was going to uh, massacre all of the Jews, eradicate the entire Jewish people from the kingdom. And he even decided to set up a certain specific day as to when this would take place. And to find that day, he actually instituted a lottery. And the lottery came out with a particular month and a particularly day, particular day of that month. So the, the month it turned out to be was the month of the Persian month of Adar, and those months have since been adopted into the Jewish category, into the Jewish calendar. And that's the month of Adar. And on the 14th day of this month, this massacre, massacre was supposed to be to have taken place. And it would have, had it not been for the heroic um, exploits of a Jew named Mordecai and his niece, a woman named Esther, who are the hero and heroine of our story. So what they did is through this the strategy of Mordecai and through the court intrigues of Esther, who happened to have been the queen by um, uh, certain intricacies that are described in the text, uh, they foiled this plan and, and it all came to nothing. And in fact, Haman and his 10 sons were killed towards the end and the Jews had this amazing victory. And the celebration of Purim is to celebrate this 25, this victory that took place 2,500 years ago. It's celebrated all over the Jewish world. As far as we know, it's always been celebrated in Jewish communities for at least the past 2,000 years. The name Purim, incidentally, is, comes from the, what is apparently is the ancient Persian word for lottery, which is Pur, and Purim, or Purim means lotteries. So it's kind of an ironic name, but lotteries has become the name for this particular holiday, which is so well known. So what does that have to do with our supplementary, supplementary section that we're reading this week? So it turns out our supplementary section is sort of a precursor to Purim in a sort of strange way, and we have to give the background on that. So this is known as the story of Amalek. So Amalek is a strange word that nobody other than Jews and those who pay attention to the Bible actually have ever heard of. Amalek was an ancient tribe in the region of Israel, probably somewhere in between the Sinai Peninsula and what is now Israel, north or northeastern end of the Sinai perhaps. And they were nomadic perhaps, no great significance, they don't, probably were not very large, but they were a tribe in that area. In the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. Described shortly after the crossing of the sea and all that, it describes how uh, this tribe, Amalek, for no reason given in the Torah, they just seem to, out of the blue, attack the Israelites. 
and it just came out of nowhere and was only due to the spiritual leadership of Moses and the military leadership of Joshua that the attack was defeated. And that is what happened. The Amalek tribe was defeated. The Israelites won. But there's a few verses towards the end of that that are very illuminating for, our, for what we're talking about today. And it says that uh, God commanded Moses to, have, to write down for the benefit of, you, of Joshua this story so that he would always remember it. And then God says that God will obliterate, the Hebrew word is Zecher Amalek. The Hebrew word is Zecher Amalek, which is translated in various ways. It means the memory of Amalek or the reminder of Amalek, something like that. God will obliterate this memory or reminder of Amalek. And then the, the paragraph, the short paragraph, closes with a dramatic statement that God sort of swears that um, there will be a war between God and Amalek for all generations. That's the Amalek incident as it's recorded in the book of Exodus. Our particular section is not that, but it's something, an equally short section that comes towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, in the 25th chapter there. And this is where the actual Parashat Zahor comes up, the section dealing with the word Zahor or remember. And this section deals with um, a commandment that Moshe gives to the Israelites uh, to remember what Amalek did. And I'm going to read the actual words of the commandment. And here we go. Um, remember what Amalek did to you on your way out of Egypt. When they encountered you on the way and you were tired and exhausted, they cut off those lagging to your rear and they did not fear God. Therefore, when Hashem gives you peace from all the enemies around you in the land that Hashem your God is giving you as a heritage, you must obliterate any reminder of a Malik from under the heavens. You must not forget. So we have here a couple of interesting things. First of all, we have that there's an obvious connection between these two little sections. One is it deals with the attack of a Malik and the defeat of a Malik. And then it has this idea of obliterating the Zecher Amalek, obliterating the memory or reminder of Amalek. In both, in both paragraphs, this phrase comes up. In one, it is God who will do this obliteration, and in the other, it's the Israelites who are charged to do this obliteration. And that sort of inconsistency is something we'll put off right now until the very end. But remember, that's a question. Why, is, why are the two sections of the Torah somewhat inconsistent in this regard? We are going to first deal with a, another question, which is um, on this final section, the Parshat Zahor, remember what they did. It says we're commanded to remember what they did, and, and a parallel command is to never forget what they did. So far, so good. But then in the middle, it's that other commandment to obliterate the memory or the reminder of Amalek. Just obliterate them, make sure they're not around at all. This seems to be a little bit contradictory. If you're supposed to remember it and never forget it, you're not obliterating the memory of it. And if you're obliterating the, remember, the memory of it, then you're not remembering it. So how is this supposed to be answered? It, it happens to be that this is only rarely discussed in the vast amount of commentaries on this paragraph because there's what appears to be an easy answer to this question. So the easy answer is the following. Obliterate the Zecher Amalek, the memory or the reminder of Amalek, is generally interpreted to mean the following. Obliterate them, simply obliterate the tribe, wipe them all out, all the people, even all the animals, just wipe them out. And this interpretation is borne out by a section later on in the Bible, in the book of Samuel, the 17th, or the 15th chapter of the first book of Samuel, where the prophet Samuel uh, tells, commands the new king, Saul, that he is supposed to actually take up this other commandment of obliterating the tribe of Amalek. He tells him, go attack them and kill them all. So Saul does this, and he pretty much follows the instructions to the T with one unexplained exception. He allows the king, whose name was Agag, to survive. And because of this, Saul says that, or Shmuel, uh, Samuel says that Saul's kingdom will no longer last. His dynasty will end with him and it won't, will not carry on. And this is exactly the way it happened. When Saul died a, a couple years later, his line did not carry on the kingdom and it passed over to 
the famous King David. So that appears to be the uh, Samuel uh, demanding of the king that he fulfill this commandment of obliterating the tribe of Amalek. This is all well and good, uh, and this could be what this commandment actually means with the following little technical detail problem, which is that the commandment actually says to obliterate the Zecher Amalek. It doesn't say to obliterate Amalek themselves, which might be part of this whole thing, and that's what Samuel actually did, or Samuel actually commanded, but there's this additional element of obliterating the memory of them or uh, the reminder of them. So how are we supposed to do that? And if it truly means it's not simply a matter of obliterating the people, but obliterating the memory of these people, then how do we accomplish that if, if uh, there's a commandment to remember what they did? How can you do both things? How can you both always remember what they did and never forget it and obliterate the, remem the memory of these people? It seems like it's a contradiction. So there is possibly an answer to this question. And the answer would go like this. It has to do with the difference between remembering something and a reminder. So what might that difference be? The difference might be the following. Remembering something, you just remember something where you call what that thing was so that you can re-experience it perhaps or just know what happened, whatever it might be. In the case of Amalek, it's remembering what happened in the attack, how they were defeated, how it happened, all the details. Remembering the actual event. The reminder part of it perhaps means the following. A reminder bringing back to mind what exactly Amalek stands for. What do they mean to us? What do they mean to the Jews? What do they mean to the world? What do they mean to the Bible? What is a Malik all about? That's what the reminder is. We are supposed to obliterate that reminder. Even though we remember what they did, we are supposed to obliterate what they stand for. So what do they stand for? Now, I, I, I just want to, uh, to note here the following, that if it weren't for the Bible and if it weren't for the Jews, in all likelihood, nobody would it know about this tribe Amalek. There's some obscure tribe on the corner of the Sinai Peninsula. There's hundreds of these tribes all over the world that had vanished 3,000, 2,000, 4,000 years ago. They just vanished in the, in the fog of history and nobody heard of them. If it weren't for the fact that it was written in the Bible and that the Jews constantly remember this, they read this section every year and they make a big deal out of this Amalek, you will not find an Orthodox Jew who is not familiar with the concept of Amalek and what it means. It's such an important concept in Judaism, but by the very fact that we make such a big deal of it, we are preventing their memory from being obliterated. But if we recognize that there's this difference between remembering what they did and obliterating what they stand for, perhaps this problem is rectified. But what did they stand for? So there aren't many clues in the Torah as to what they actually stand for, what they stood for. In the Exodus description, there's just nothing. They just attacked out of nowhere. There's no reason given for why they attacked. They just attacked and they were defeated. And that's that. And then it says those dramatic lines about how there's this eternal battle between God and Amalek for all generations. For no particular reason, what did they, what did they do to deserve this status? In the section in Deuteronomy, there's a few more clues. It says they didn't fear God. It says they attacked the weak and the tired and, and all that. Uh, but these descriptions could fit into many groups and tribes and whatever out of the Bible. And why is Amalek singled out out of all of them? None of them feared God, presumably. And now they all, all might have attacked the weak or who knows what they did. This doesn't sound like that big of a deal. So there is one other very tiny clue that might help us out with this. In the, the phrase when it, said, um, when it said, they encountered you on the way, the Hebrew word for encountered you is this very short Hebrew word that to some degree defies translation. The word in Hebrew is karcha, and the ha part of karcha is you. So the kar part is what needs to be explained. So the standard translation, which is probably the like, it's like likely meaning of the actual word, is they just sort of encountered or happened upon or chanced upon you which doesn't really tell us much, just they happen to be in the same era and they attacked. But there is another interpretation that is sort of favored amongst the Jewish commentaries. And that's the word kar also means cold. So they sort of cooled you off. Now, what does this mean? What did it mean they cooled you? How did they cool you off? So they give a sort of analogy of a, a bath, a very hot bath that everybody's afraid to go in because it's just steaming hot and nobody wants to get scorched by this bath. 
And this one person decides, well, I'm going to break this fear. I'm going to be the one who dives in and shows everybody else that it can be done. And this person, even though they themselves get scorched, breaks the fear for everybody else and enables them to sort of dive in also. So that's the cooling off. This person who cooled off the bath, cooled them off, cooled off the bath in two ways. Physically, by a cooler physical body going in there, it kind of cools off the water, as we all know. And then there's also the psychological cooling of this person dove in and got hurt and everything, but everybody else saw that it could be done. And if I could do it, then you could do it. So how does this apply to Amalek? The Israelites at this point had a sort of aura of invincibility about them. They were protected by God. And presumably everybody else, all these other nations and tribes were afraid of attacking them. And Amalek on their own sort of decided they were in the right time and the right place. They decided we're going to attack them to break the ice here and to destroy this aura of invincibility. They were the ones who, who sort of burst through that veil and showed everybody else these guys are no different than us. They can be attacked. The divine protection that they, are, they may have, we can deal with that also and we can fight against that. So this is really what Amalek stands for. To a great degree, this is how the Purim story is understood. Haman, it says in the, in the Scroll of Esther, it says that Haman wanted to destroy the Jews for no great reason other than the fact that, he says, they are different from everybody else. They have their own customs and laws, and they don't follow the law, they don't abide by the customs of the kingdom, they have their own thing. For that, Haman wanted to kill them. This, to one degree or another, really follows in the footsteps of Amalek. To attack the Jews simply because they are Jews. That's what Amalek stood for, and Haman also stood for the same thing. It happens to be that towards the end of the book of Esther, and what I believe is the last mention of the name of Haman, he's mentioned many times in the, when the, when, uh, in the scroll of Esther, and I, what I believe is the last one, he's mentioned with his tribal lineage. He's called Haman HaAgagi. Haman the Agagite, or something like that. And what this Agagi thing means, it's traditionally interpreted, is he comes from the tribe or the group of Agag. And Agag was, of course, none other than our king of Amalek, whom Saul spared. So Haman was from that tribe, either literally he was a descendant of that tribe, or in some sense he followed in the footsteps of what Agag and Amalek represented. And that's why the connection between the supplementary section that we read this week and the, the holiday of Purim and the book of Esther. So to sum everything up, what we have here is the following. There's two commandments given in this section of Parshat Zahor, the remembrance section. One is the commandment to never forget what they did, to, to remember what they did and never forget what they did. And the second is this other command to obliterate what they stand for. There is no contradiction between these two commandments. In fact, they sort of complement and supplement one another. If you remember what they did and you never forget what they did, you will have all the more inspiration to obliterate what they stand for. This really, when you get down to it, this is really what this, the famous slogan that we hear all the time in regards to the Holocaust, never again is really all about. Remembering what the Holocaust was about and making sure that it doesn't happen again. That's the commandment of obliterating the Zecher Amalek, the reminder of Amalek. Now, as far as that question that we kind of left behind several minutes ago, about a certain inconsistency between the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. In Exodus, again, it says that God is the one who will obliterate this reminder of Amalek. And in Deuteronomy, it says that we are charged with this mission of obliterating the reminder of Amalek. So whose job is it? So this one's not so hard to answer. Perhaps the answer is that we're both involved, both us and God. We have to do the dirty work. We're in the trenches and we have to bear the burden of, of anti-Semitism, this never-ending disease that has affected the world and historians have always been puzzled by it and sociologists, nobody has a real solid explanation as to why this exists in the world. It's why it's such a persistent thing through, for thousands of years. Why is that always around? The Jews have to bear that burden and they are charged with the mission of, in some way or another, eradicating it. Handling it, dealing with it, and perhaps eradicating it. It's an eternal battle. Where does God come into this whole thing? 
So God comes in in the sort of familiar kind of subtle background role, not just not splitting the sea for us, but somewhere in the background when the going gets tough and it's just too difficult and you just can't handle it. And I've just had enough and I cannot handle this torture and this suffering and whatever it might be. You need a little push, almost like a wind at your back that just sort of helps you up the hill. And that's where God comes in. When the going gets tough, when it's just too difficult, and the fight to fight for what's right and what's good becomes too tough and you don't think you can handle anymore, it's inf of infinite value to know that God is in your corner. Shabbat Shalom.